Good to see everyone. Welcome to my talk called Birdsong as Code. So logistically, I should just explain, I'm going to be giving this talk from within Vim with a closure REPL running overtone in the background. So if those words don't mean very much to you, don't worry. It should be hopefully fairly self-evident what's actually going on. Um, but if you're into functional programming and Lisp and things like that, you might find that interesting. So just a quick demonstration. You can see this line here that I'm highlighting. Um, what Lisp does is it puts the function as the first argument. So that says multiply 220 by 3, uh, by, um, 3 over 2. And I can display the result here. Uh, I could also add it's, uh, 550. Uh, and the reason I'm picking those two operations is the great theme of this talk will be the difference between addition and multiplication. So we'll get there later. <laughs> The other thing, uh, that's a joke, but also true. Uh, the other thing I can do is, because Lisp is not a pure programming language, is that I can execute side effects. All right, so I just executed a bit of code that uh, played some bird song, which is the subject of this talk. So I think there's two things that hopefully I can convince you of that will allow you to appreciate this talk. The first is that Birdsong is worthwhile taking seriously as a musical study. So the music theory of Birdsong is something that's interesting. The second thing I need to convince you of is that using computer code to represent music theory is something that actually elucidates the subject. And it's that second point that I'm going to start with. So if you look at these two values here, right, we have one which is I'm calling raw and the other one I'm calling computed. They are actually extension, their extension is equal, right? So if I execute code that says, are they equal? It says true, right? So you could say in some sense, those are the same value. But if you look at them, they're not constructed in the same way. And I would argue that the second one, the computed one, goes a lot further in explaining what's going on with that value, right? So you might look at all those numbers, and if you spend a little bit of time looking at it, you might be able to see that like there's one one, there's two twos, there's three threes, and you might be able to reverse engineer what's going on. But if you look at the computation here, it kind of lays it out. So this says we've got the range of numbers of one to, well, one to seven, because it's not inclusive. We map a function that repeats each number n times, and then we concatenate everything together. So I'm from the school of thought that says that if you can structure a computation around a value and it does so successfully in code that is shorter than the original value, that represents some kind of achievement of understanding. So if we can do the same thing as using uh, code as a notation for music or for birdsong specifically, that allows us to, to think about uh, that we might have exploited some of the structure or, or understood it. Uh, one of the nice side effects is that if you want to change the value and you've structured the computation successfully, the change you want to make is probably natural in terms of code. So if I only want uh, even numbers, here, I can, I can do so, and I get that, that result, right? And it's easy to do. If I had to edit the raw value, that would be kind of finicky, and you would, your attention would start to wander uh, while we're doing this. So that's the first thing. Oh, or maybe I should also mention, like, there are alternative ways of representing music, right? This is a spectrogram, so you can see things directly. There's all sorts of things you can see in this representation that you can't see in a code representation. But there's also all sorts of understanding that, and of the, the way it's structured that you can't get. Um, maybe even one other example. Um, this is Western music notation of a piece of bird song. And this representation is great in one way because it allows a person who knows how to read this notation to engage with bird song, but it's also opaque in other ways. And maybe something this notation does is it imposes a particular expectation for what features of music are relevant to the viewer. And with code, we have the luxury of developing new subroutines, new ways of dividing up logic as we need it. So back to the code. So the, the academic subject that I'm relying upon for this talk is called zoomusicology. And it's not really well established. It's multidisciplinary. It kind of is a bit ill-defined. Um, but effectively, it's the study of music in animal culture. Right? So there's... Uh, musicology is the study of music theory. Ethnomusicology is the study of music by people with an ethnicity, which I guess theoretically should be everyone, but in practice it's not used that way. 
uh, and zoomusicology is for people who are not human, right? Uh, and the two sources that I'm really going to be relying upon for this talk are a book called Is Bird Song Music by Hollis Taylor, where she argues that we should see birds not as specimens, not as scientific subjects, but as collaborators, as colleagues, as artists. And a scientific paper called Overtone-Based Pitch Selection in Hermit Thrush Song, uh, which is a little bit more, as the name suggests, uh, scientific. But it, the nice thing about this is it provides a theory and a structure that I'm able to apply to the uh, content of the book. Right? So the two birds we'll be focusing on are the, well, mostly the Pied Butcher Bird, to be honest, which is a, an Australian songbird using theory derived from the hermit thrush, which North American people might be aware of is endemic to this area. So there is a question about whether birdsong is music that I actually don't think is very interesting, but I feel like I have to engage just a little bit to defend this talk, right? So there are some people who see music and art as somehow essentially human, and so they often seek to draw boundaries that allows human music to count as art, but doesn't allow whale song, bird song, or you know, other creative expressions by the animal kingdom to count as art. So they might say uh, something like, ah, but uh, a human musician is able to create and vary what they're doing, whereas a bird just plays the same thing every time. It's not actually true, but people still say it. Birds can, can vary, right? Uh, I've, I've read people say, ah, but a bird is instrumental about its art. Bird song sounds like music, but actually what's going on is the bird is just trying to attract mates, right? And I think if you're familiar with the way music exists in human culture, you might say <laughs> that's, a, if anything, something that's very consistent with what we're doing. So I, 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 take the, I don't like the anthropocentric approach. I think the big difference maybe is scalability, right? So human beings do have ways of transmitting our culture that birds don't. So, you know, bird bark didn't have anyone to write down what they were coming up with. Bird Billy Holiday didn't have anyone to make recordings of their awesome song. So while birds do teach each other, and songbirds, about half of the bird kingdom, rely on having other birds to learn from in order to become songbirds, I think it is true to say that you know, bird culture doesn't, it's not the same as human culture. But we should still, I think, look at it, respect it, and find it interesting. And I think probably most of the differences, just like this scalability, transmissibility difference, most of the differences between birds and humans can be explained through the material circumstances of, of birds. So you, you, can, you can treat it as interesting and equal without trying to pretend that it's the same. Uh, but really the biggest argument in favour of birdsong being music in my mind is just, I don't really want to be the kind of person that listens to birdsong and thinks that's not music, right? I think, I think it's more axiomatic to me, right? So if someone said, is birdsong music? I think the most powerful way of uh, convincing them is just to play. And if you had listened closely, you might actually hear that variation principle, right? That it was the, the same song three times, but each time the bird developed it more. That's a pied butcher bird. Here's a hermit thrush for completeness. Right. So I don't want to be the kind of person who doesn't think that's music, so I will treat it as such. Uh, so to start with, in order to discuss the difference between human and bird music, uh, I need to start with the commonalities. Right, so I'm going to start with physical properties of sound and then later move on to the differences. So what this uh, two-line uh, definition does is define a synthesizer that just emits sine oscillation uh, at, at a given frequency. So this is what it sounds like. Oh, sorry, a bit loud. Um, and you can see that if I make the frequency higher, the sound is higher. Right? So sound is a pressure wave that goes through air and the higher the frequency, the higher the sound. Now, so far what I played you just briefly there is something that just continues over time, right? There's no event, but we know that when we listen to music, notes happen at a certain time, and, and that dimension of time is part of uh, how it works. So uh, the next stage that I need to talk about is shaping notes. So when we do this in synthesizers, we often talk about envelopes. So what envelopes are is a a signal that controls how loud the note is, and that includes the original point when the note, the attack of the note begins, and it gets louder and gets to its maximum volume, and then when the note closes out as well. So this line here says, 
um, define me an envelope that takes 0.3 seconds to get loud and 0.9 seconds to get soft again. And this is what it sounds like. So it kind of fades out, right? Uh, if I were to make this a bit more percussive by shortening the attack, it sounds a bit more chime-like. Oops, let me just reevaluate it. Right. By the way, uh, I, uh, whenever I give music coding talks, I always remember the advice of a, a really strong talk giver. Uh, she's given some talks at Strange Loop, and her advice is never give live coding talks. And the reason being <laughs> is that she says that there's, uh, there's too much risk, it's too easy to lose the audience, right? So hopefully you'll indulge me here. Um, but there is always some degree of risk when you're typing code in front of an audience that you'll type malformed uh, S expressions. Now, this is another interesting property of sound. And I'm going to say the simple generalization first before problematizing it, which is that fractions sound good, right? So when there are frequencies that are kind of in a, a whole integer relationship, they sound like they're harmonizing. So if I play these two sounds at once, we get a kind of a harmonizing effect. Um, and you know, maybe I can change this and get different ones, right? So when you add those two signals together, the lowest common multiple of the frequency is uh, the frequency of the combined sound wave. So when these things have a nice ratio, this the combined sound wave, though it has various like wheels and stuff to it, it repeats over a short and understandable period. Let's play that again. Now the reason that I have that asterisk and I don't quite want to say that fractions sound good is it's a little bit of a category error, right? So so far I've talked about physical properties of sound, but sounding good is something that exists only within a particular culture with a respect to a person's taste. So the ratio of um, four on three was actually in medieval Europe regarded as a dissonance. I don't think modern people would regard that as true and it's kind of the ratio of four and three is the basis of the first chord change that is really distinctive about blues music. So there is definitely a, an interpretive step that determines whether resonant actually translates to good. The other thing I wanna show you is that it doesn't have to be exact, right? So if I almost get the ratio of four and three, it's kind of still pretty good. Uh, maybe let's go 405. It's a little bit wobblier. If you're a good musician, you might start to hear like the, the wobbling there. And if I go, I don't know, to 415, that's a bit sour, right? To our taste, right? And that's to our taste because it's entirely possible that's a kind of effect that would work within a given musical context. So it's pretty lucky that it doesn't have to be exactly accurate because if it had to be exactly, exactly accurate, we wouldn't be able to do it, right? But it's also worth bearing in mind that there are these little, little differences still get rounded out and generalized and our brains can work out kind of what's going on. So I've simplified a little bit uh, what is going on with real sources of sound. So I said that a sound wave is a single frequency, but it's actually more true to say that it's a series of frequencies. So there's a fundamental frequency, but then another frequency that's twice as high with half the wavelength normally comes out of most real physical sources of sound. And another one that's three times, another one that's four times, etc. So the Bottom one, the fundamental frequency, is the loudest and the one that determines what pitch we hear the note as, but there's actually multiple things going on at once. And before I play you it, I want to actually do a physical demonstration of this. I'll step away from the mic, but hopefully you'll be able to see what's going on. Right? So imagine this slinky spring is like a, a guitar string. Right? right? So that's the fundamental frequency, but let's see if I can get one of the harmonics out of it. Right, so that's a, the next one. Let's see if I, oh, <laughs> oh thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> well, I think I can probably do the third one as well, but uh, because the higher harmonics take kind of more energy and they're softer, um, it's harder and harder to do that. So I'll see if I can do it. All right, so let's get back to the coding. So this synthesizer, 
um, this has one sound here at the base frequency, one times frequency. Then we've got a times two, times three, times four, times five. And for each one of them, I'm basically making it softer. Um, so it'll still sound like kind of artificial and synthesizer-like, but it should also sound kind of fuller, like there's more to it. So this is the, the non-harmonic one, and this is the harmonic one. Let's maybe make it higher. So when there's real sources of sound, when you're hearing an acoustic guitar, when you're hearing anything that's made from resonation and a physical um, resonance in a physical uh, space, in a tube, in a string, that's what you're likely to hear. Right, and just before I go to the next section, I just want to note that I've seen, I've shown to you two different principles for having families of frequencies. Right, so this one here I could call linear. So we have a fundamental frequency, then double, triple, etc. So each step is the same number of hertz. The other principle I showed you was uh, ratios. I said that ratios that are simple and understandable sound good. So that's where, why well, I said earlier that we we're going to talk about addition and multiplication. Because those two different principles of generating possibilities of sound uh, are very relevant to the music theory. So the exponential scale uh, is kind of how modern human pop music works. So if I can explain it in code, with the exponential scale, we start with a fundamental frequency, which is like, you know, maybe the song is in C, maybe it's in A, whatever, that determines the starting point. And then we multiply it by stacked 12th roots of two, right? So uh, this line says, defines the 12th root of two, and this just says we multiply the fundamental by the 12th root of two to N. So maybe I can, um, just show it on the guitar, I think. Right, so we see we've got this instrument here, so it's a, like a piano keyboard. So the difference between these two sounds is called an octave, and it's a doubling of frequency. Or halving, because I'm playing it the other way around. And you can see there's actually 12 jumps in between. Right? So that's where we get the 12th root of 2 from. Right? So each one, of these, each one of these adjacent buttons represents a ratio of like about 1.06, something like that. Um, and so no matter where we are, the relationship of a note to its neighbours is based on this, this ratio. Let's just uh, play a scale, an exponential scale based on that. Right, so it sounds roughly like a normal scale. For those musicians in the audience, yes, I did play both the major and the minor seventh, so it's kind of more of a bebop scale than a normal one. Um, I'm doing that for a reason of comparison later. So if you understand what I'm talking about, then give yourself a thumbs up, but you don't need to. <laughs> right. Um, so let me just retune the key tone. Much easier than a physical instrument. And we can move to the, the bird version, which I'm calling the linear scale, because I'm trying to avoid kind of musical jargon. So the linear scale works like our harmonic series before, right? So we start with a fundamental frequency, and then as we walk up, we just multiply everything by n. So if the fundamental frequency is 100 hertz, then what we have is 100, 200, 300, 400, 1,000, 1,100, et cetera. And so uh, let me play that for you. And it's going to sound similar, but not exactly the same. Right, so there's a couple of notes that might, without necessarily knowing what's going on, sound a bit sour to you. And that's because of your expectations being based on the 12th root of 2 system, right? There's nothing inherently wrong or incorrect about those, no those numbers. And in fact, those numbers are in some sense more pure because they're based on integers and not based on you know, irrational fractions. To make it easier to compare though, I can play the two of them at the same time because there's one thing we're good at, it's hearing the distance between two frequencies. Um, so uh, uh, let's play the exponent, if you can read this, these three lines of code, let's play the exponential scale with the linear scale at the same time. And you should hear some notes sounding really sweet together and others sounding really clashing. Right. I think what's remarkable about that is not that there's clashing, but there's any that kind of work well, right? So wh why, why would that be the case, that we've got this like 12th root of 2, an irrational number, and we've got this other system that's linear? Why, why would they line up at all? 
Uh, let me just play again. And the answer is that the 12th root of 2 system is really good at approximating some whole number of fractions. Not so good at others, but really good at some of them. So if you take four steps on this guitar, those make uh, what you might call a major third if you're into music theory. And it doesn't make exactly the ratio, but it's close enough that we can, we can figure it out. So let me just evaluate this. So I'm just taking a random scale and I'm uh, getting the ratio between four steps. So let's evaluate it. So it comes to 1.25992, right? That's almost 1.25. That's almost a, a, a pure thing. So it's close enough that we get the point. Um, I think we even get an um, a even better approximation if we go seven steps. Uh, does anyone know what seven steps is? Maybe. So it's almost 1.5, right? 1.498. So with this system of, of approximation, it's good enough that we can make these harmonies happen. Uh, so uh, that's why we have some frequencies that line up and that the, the bird linear scale and the human exponential scale have enough similarity that we can, uh, we can see that they're compatible. Now something that human beings do, and I think we can speculate as to why, but we have something called octave equivalence. So that means that if we play a melody twice, once where every frequency is doubled, we hear it as kind of the same thing a second time, right? So in the same way as that 10 a.m. one day is the same in a sense of 10 a.m. the next day, there's kind of this cyclical pattern. That's something about how we interpret music. Um, so that's partly why this octave, this doubling is really relevant because each time you double, you get into an equivalent of the same space. Um, you might speculate that that's due to the uh, different voice ranges of human beings where we have you know, people of different singing ability and that if they want to sing the same thing at the same time, our different sizes means that you need somehow to have an equivalence between two different ranges, um, but I don't, think, I don't think we know that for sure. But let me play just the start of a children's uh, melody once and then once where, if you see at the end of the line there, I'm adding 12 to it. So I'm going up 12 steps on the keto. Right, that second one, it's clearly not the same thing, right? It's way higher, but it also clearly is the same thing in some way, right? There's some kind of equivalence. You can hear that there's a pitch class equivalence, to use the, the jargon. Maybe I can even make it clearer if I play them at the same time. Right, that sounds like... You know, you might call that singing in unison, right? It's not the same pitch, but because of octave equivalence, um, it's almost the same. Now, why am I talking about this? Because this is a human thing. It's because it's believed that birds and other animals don't have octave equivalence. So maybe they don't have that same uh, difference in range of people of the species that they need to be compatible, or maybe they just don't have the same practice of singing together that we do, but it's something that birds don't have. And maybe if you think about this linear scale, it might also make sense because the exponential scale, with its 12th root of 2, is highly symmetric. Wherever you start, you can go up and down and you have the same ratios, whereas the linear scale is not like that. So the difference between 200 and 300 hertz is very different than the difference between 1600 and, seven, and, and 1700 hertz, right? The fraction between them is different. Um, so, so perhaps, again, that's why birds appear to not, not hear that equivalence. Uh, now, I've talked about a human melody, so I should make sure that I'm uh, equal here with our bird colleagues. And uh, I want to mention something that is called the species call of the pied butcher bird. So there's this particular three-note series that butcher birds incorporate very often into their song. And the nice thing about it is it kind of marks them out. So if you're in the bush and you're trying to work out whether it's a pied butcher bird or a similar bird, this species call is kind of a genre marker, you could say. Now, they don't echo it exactly the same each time. It's kind of more of a, a motif that they can improvise on, but it's, it's very present. So here's my synthesized version. Right, and you can see that I've just done this by picking out the harmonic series, the 18th, the 18th, and the 16th harmonic of the fundamental frequency, which I'm specifying as 130 here. Now, let me play some real butcher bird sound. And um, it's, this clip is deliberately chosen because it has heaps of 
uh, species called splice together, but among kind of normal notes, you'll keep hearing these de -de -de kind of notes in various forms. Right? So they kind of like shoot up higher than the rest of the notes and do that. So that's a distinctive feature of kind of the genre of Pied Butcher Bird Song. I'm calling it the species call. Now, uh, I want to also not just automate that, I want to I show you something a bit more complicated. So this is uh, Audio 24 as it's known, because it's uh, in the, uh, the book Is Bird Song Music. There's a whole series of audio clips, and this Audio 24 is one of the ones that Hollis Taylor discusses. Uh, she makes the clips available on the internet, by the way, which is quite nice for really appreciating what's going on. So the way that I'm going to put this into code is I'm going to take a raw version, which just has kind of, you know, exact fractions to many decimal places of the sound, and I'm going to override the pitch with this harmonic series model, right? So I'm going to say the first note is the 11th harmonic, 11 times the fundamental, then the 10 times, 10 times, 12 times, 12, 9, 9, 8, etc. Then I'm going to actually insert the species call in there because that appears. So when I way back at the start said that writing things in code can illuminate understanding, you can see this is demonstrating that those are not just random notes, but they're the species call. Um, and I'm going to play, first I'll play, maybe I'll just play the, the bird version, and then I'll play them, uh, my version and the bird version together so you can hear whether or not you think it's an adequate model. So here's the bird version. Right, so that's just a pied butcher bird. And here it is uh, sounding a bit like Steve Reich, different trains, I think, with the synthesizer version over the top. Right, so you can kind of hear that it's close. It's not exactly right, um, but that's the thing about these kind of models that show understanding. They don't have to be lossless in order to illustrate something, right? So I think it's, I think it's, it's close enough to be interesting, right? Um, but not not uh, not exactly right. So I'll just play it again. Species cool. Right. So uh, the scientific paper about uh, overtone-based pitch selection uses a much more numeric method to compare whether or not their model is is working. So they kind of take the differences between what their model predicts and the actual pitch and square that. So it means that the further apart the sounds are, the kind of the bigger it shows up. So I haven't done a rigorous analysis of the Pied Butcher Bird song in this way. Um, I guess you could if someone was bored and wants to follow up the code at home. Um, but I have done just kind of a rough thing to show you. So if I, um, if I use the exponential scale, like the human scale, the average different squared comes to 942, and if I use, you don't need to know the unit or anything, um, and if I uh, do the same thing with the linear, uh, it comes to 563. So small is better, and basically the, that exponential scale, I'm arguing at least for this very cherry-picked example, um, is, a better, is a better approximation. Uh, right. so I want to say a little bit more about uh, not just looking at, as birds as specimens, because uh, in the original version of this talk, I, I ended with that kind of difference of squares analysis to kind of defend my, my model. And I realized that was a very hypocritical note to end on, right? Because I was treating birdsong in a kind of a cold, non-collaborative way. I was treating it like a regression puzzle. Um, I was treating it like I was just modeling numbers and not like I was treating them like, you know, like colleagues or artists like that. Um, so I want to do a little bit more kind of blending of what musical practice would look like uh, between birdsong and humans. So what we have here is a mapping between keys on the keyboard and linear notes as the, uh, as the pied butcher bird might sing them. So one thing I think is kind of cool to see out here is that, so if you think X is an unmapped note, that if you look at the very low notes, so each one of these horizontal lines represents an octave, it represents 12 numbers, um, there's only one note that I can map to a pied butcher bird in the first line. Then a second line, there's two numbers, right? Because the second and the third harmonic appear in the second octave. Then there's four numbers, so it's doubling each time. There's 
uh, eight numbers. And as you get into the higher octaves, we now have the opposite problem, where in the lower pitches, we have buttons that if you're playing birdsong on the guitar, don't do anything. And later on, we have this problem where there aren't enough buttons because there's so many harmonics that fit between a doubling of the frequency, right? So between 10,000 and 20,000 hertz, well, that's a doubling of frequency. That's, that's an octave in our music. But there's a lot of harmonics of a sound that would appear in there. But still, um, I'm going to try something. So uh, uh, I think, um, was it Chekhov who said in the playwright that if you bring a gun to the first act of a play, you have to, like, fire it by the third act? I think that probably also applies to guitars. So I'm going <laughs> to... I am going to try playing that, but also... <laughs> Uh, but also what I want to demonstrate is the kind of the interest and the difficulty in playing with this scale because there's, um, there's some things that work really well because there's a really nice uh, resonant even ratios you can get out of playing in the bird scale because it's based on the harmonic series, which is nicer than kind of our conventional pop one. Um, but there's also just like kind of notes that are missing. So if you were playing in C major, just talking to the musicians for a second, like there's no kind of F or A that's acceptable within the normal range, right? So you, you can't kind of make the normal chords or harmonies. But even working around that, I'm going to try and indulge myself in something and do a little bit of a, a collaboration with the birds. Uh, and it's, the other thing I want to show is that at least so far I've, I've had this paradigm of where I'm working from examples, right? So I'm not, um, I wasn't um, uh, integrating a whole bunch of bird song together. I was saying, here's one example, I'm going to treat it kind of in isolation and play it and think about it, then I'm going to have another example, and I'm going to have another example. That's not really how bird song works in the wild, right? We, have the, we don't have the dawn soloist, we have the dawn chorus, right? You're out in the bush, you're hearing lots of different birds in different directions. They're also like not tuned together. So in a human orchestra, right, everyone, you hope, is tuning their instruments to be the same. So that starting point of the scale whether it's 130 hertz or 440 hertz or whatever the convention is, they all agree on that same convention. That's not something that's practical within the material circumstances of birds out there because, you know, you're hearing one person who, well, one other bird who's 20 metres away, another that's 100 away, etc. So I'm going to play, try playing a few birds together as well as um, playing the guitar with it. And I'm not going to try to imitate the bird song. I'm going to try to maybe fill in a bit of the, the gap in what birds do. So, uh, you know, rhythm, harmony, bass, these are things that are very prevalent in human music, but birds, for practical reasons, aren't really that into. So I'm going to try to, <laughs> I'm going to, try, to, try, to, try, to try to do that bit, right? So let's see if, it, uh, if this works. I'm going to start a loop up. You can hear that one that I was synthesizing before, right?
Thanks very much.